Well, everybody, thanks for being here. We're really thrilled that you've joined us and welcome to our second annual Rare Disease Day event at UCLA. My name is Dan Geshwind and I am the Senior Associate Dean and Associate Vice Chancellor for Precision Health at UCLA. I'm also a faculty in the Department of Neurology, Psychiatry and Human Genetics. As we get started, I wanna note that this webinar is being recorded and you will receive a copy of the recording. We are really excited to connect with you today as these virtual events give us the opportunity to bring together people from our region and way beyond in recognition of International Rare Disease Day that's promoted through the National Organization of Rare Disorders or NORD. I'm delighted to be here to represent how UCLA is revolutionizing medicine through the Institute for Precision Health and truly one of our capstone programs, the California Center for Rare Diseases. Through our programs, we aim to integrate advances in big data and genomics to transform medicine and to achieve the best patient outcomes through the ability to improve our predictions, diagnostics, as well as treatments. Advances in technology and gene sequencing have really opened a window to understanding an individual patient's unique genetic makeup. So we're now able to more precisely understand why a disease may manifest in a particular patient specifically, as well as more broadly in different populations of patients, both based on ethnicity and other factors. We hope that you'll come away today inspired and hopeful for what we believe is a bright future. The UCLA Institute for Precision Health and Center for Rare Diseases really serves as a nexus for interdisciplinary collaboration across the David Geffen School of Medicine, UCLA Health System, and the entire campus, really raising the awareness of rare diseases and, and the power of genomics and precision health approaches. This is embodied by one, another initiative called the Atlas Community Health Initiative, which is biobanking patient samples with their consent across UCLA Health. To date, we've enrolled more than 65,000 patients, consented over 110,000, and have the ability to use these samples to conduct research to create big data, genomic data, to better understand, diagnose, and treat genetic disease, both common and rare. In August 2020, in fact, because of this, we entered into a collaboration with Regeneron Genetics Center to sequence the genomes for all patients in the Atlas Biobank. Already 41,000 patients have been included in the Regeneron collaboration. We hope to improve the diversity of reference data by that. This initiative is set to become one of the largest and most comprehensive in the nation. Patients with rare genetic diseases will be included within these efforts and may lead to profound new insights and facilitation of genetic discovery. In the course of this study, we will also identify rare genetic risk factors for a wide range of more common diseases, ranging from cancer to bone disorders, neurodevelopmental disorders, and heart disease. We are also working on putting a system in place where we will be able to return results for findings that are clinically relevant back to the patients who have participated in this research so that they can be informed about disease risk and that we can implement preventative strategies later this year. Additionally, plans are underway for the Ginsburg Center Clinical Research Suite, a state-of-the-art multidisciplinary clinical suite on the Westwood campus to integrate translational and clinical research in rare diseases with coordinated care and treatment strategies for patients with genetic disease. We deeply care for our patients and together we've been able to make incredible progress in precision health and rare disease from diagnosis to treatment. Every step on this path requires a partnership with our patients in our community. So keep your eyes open for many advances to come and please stay in touch with us. With the formation of the California Center for Rare Diseases several years ago, we have aligned and organized all our strengths in rare disease research and clinical care. 
And now I'm really thrilled to introduce one of the heroes of our work in rare diseases, one of many who you'll hear from today, Dr. Stanley Nelson, who's a professor of human genetics, a principal investigator of the UCLA Undiagnosed Disease Network, the director of our California Center for Rare Diseases, and co-founder and co-director of the Center for Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy. Dr. Nelson is a leader in genetic diagnosis, having established whole exome sequencing at UCLA as a clinical diagnostic tool here with his colleagues nearly a decade ago, one of the first to do this in the United States. He and colleagues have discovered multiple new genetic disorders in their clinics, and he has helped launch multiple clinical trials in muscle diseases. Stan, I give the floor over to you. Right. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so thank you all, and thank you all for joining us. I'd like to extend my, my welcome to you with, with Dan's. We have a fantastic program for you today. Uh, I'm going to give you a bit of a run of the show. We're going to start with a brief video featuring a truly stellar faculty member in rare disease, Dr. Yay. Carolyn Quo, who investigates genetic therapies, particularly for rare immunologic diseases. For our keynote, we're pleased to have Frank Sasanowski, who has facilitated a pathway for FDA approval for rare disease uh, drug approvals over the course of years, resulting uh, directly and indirectly in the approval of hundreds of rare disease therapeutics. He's going to share his thoughts and perspectives and experience on how we can all work together to bring novel therapies forward for rare diseases. And next up will be an expert panel with representatives from academia, industry, and advocacy who will share their perspectives on what is needed to further accelerate the discovery of new therapies and how uh, patients with rare diseases can exert the expert care we all deserve. And then finally, we have an invited group of UCLA's incredible genetics counselors as this program is growing and having a larger impact. Of, and these genetic counselors will speak about their roles in uh, various programs at UCLA in that process of unraveling various patients' diagnostics odysseys. Uh, I'd like to mention that during the program, while we cannot give specific me medical advice, we do encourage you to submit questions and down below you can do that through the Q&A function, and that will be being monitored, and you may get some tip type, typed in responses during the, the, the show, or we can save those questions and respond to you at a later time, or perhaps factor them into the panelists or other discussions along the way. So please make use of that if, if you can. Uh, we will be live monitoring those questions uh, and do our best to respond. Again, thanks for being here. So I'd like to get started on this first part with a bit of a history of where we are in the California Center for Rare Diseases. It was founded just in 2019, so we're only three years old, but it's built on a foundation of decades of efforts across UCLA Health, the David Skeffen School of Medicine in Rare Disease Work, and also includes links and research ongoing at UCLA, uh, really throughout the UCLA campus. Uh, the CCRD was created and is creating a collaborative home that's intended to serve as a home base for physicians, scientists, patients who are dedicated to improving diagnostics and clinical care, empowering discovery science, and developing and implementing novel treatments for rare genetic diseases. Since the launch, the CCRD has implemented uh, powerful and broad-based consenting of rare disease patients for translational research, collection and storage of rare disease biospecimens for research, advanced whole genomic diagnostic services, and implemented uh, CCRD genomic grounds to connect rare disease faculty and trainees with interest in rare disease questions. Even over just a short per <clears throat> period, the CCRD faculty have improved diagnosis, led to substantial new genetic discovery, and built models for how to better care for specific rare diseases. As Dan mentioned, we were amongst the first, one of the first institutions in the world to use whole exome sequencing, in both the inpatient and outpatient setting, to diagnose rare diseases, leading to more precise treatments. Our work within the UCLA and UCLA CCRD-related laboratories in the last 15 years has identified the genetic cause and novel identification of, of 60 different genetic diseases. UCLA is a leader in many areas of rare disease translational research, like Duchenne muscular dystrophy as an, as an example, where over a dozen clinical trials are in process at any one time. 
We've implemented transcriptome analysis or the analysis of all the RNA in individual cells to better understand and better interpret whole genome sequencing that leads to improvements in diagnostic uh, interpretation of, of so-called whole genome sequencing. Our goals uh, continue to include and support the idea that we really need to work towards rapid, complete, and earlier use of genomics to greatly shorten the diagnostic odyssey. There's means and routes to do that, and we should make use uh, of that as we head forward and use our genomic sequence information uh, more powerfully throughout a patient's lifetime. The CCRD will continue to deepen our understanding of genetic and epigenetic factors that lead to rare diseases and empower clinical trials, coordinate and simplify care for complex patients across the UCLA health uh, enterprise and across disciplines. Uh, we hope to foster stronger patient doctor relationships and partnerships in care. And one example of that is the formation of the genetic counseling program, which is uh, ensuring patients and their families receive support they need in both making care decisions and navigating a complex medical system over a lifetime. So we're pleased to build the CCRD within the UCLA Health because our health system is poised to provide complex care over a lifetime with integration of improved care and childhood onset diseases leading to improved care and survival is an, then a need for ongoing expert care into adulthood as the natural history of each disease changes over time. And already our clinical faculty have expertise in genetic medicine and can offer personalized care for individual patients uh, throughout uh, the lifespan span. So we hope to keep broadening these services so, and, uh, and, and contributing to novel discovery in this space. So as uh, the first part of the program, I'd like to introduce a video. This is Dr. Carolyn Kuo, uh, immunologist who's working on genetic therapies for, for rare inherited disorders. She's an assistant professor of pediatrics in the Division of Allergy, Immunology, and Rheumatology. Uh, Dr. Kuo's clinical practice focuses on the diagnosis and treatment of both pediatric and adult patients with immunodeficiency and recurrent infections. Her research investigates novel therapies for rare immunologic diseases and works on clinical and gene therapy trials for primary immunodeficiency disease. And this gives us a peek inside of her world and her work. Thank you. I look forward to coming into work every day because we're exploring the unknown and we are potentially providing hope for others. I have had the opportunity to see some of the sickest patients from all around the world. And one of the patients that always comes to mind is a six-month-old who came to us for a gene therapy clinical trial. He was so frail that he barely had the energy to cry. Gene therapy is a technique in which you alter an individual's DNA in order to treat or prevent disease. It was amazing how the gene therapy he received cured him of disease and to see him look like a chubby little boy months later. Clinical trial is a study that patients can enroll in to receive medications or therapies that have been extensively studied, but that need to be introduced into humans to demonstrate safety. The important thing is that a clinical trial doesn't occur until generally over a decade of research has been done. There certainly have been so many promising results from many of the clinical trials going on here at UCLA in which we really have been able to cure patients of severe life-threatening diseases. I really believe that patient care and research go hand in hand. Many times when I see patients with ultra-rare or undiagnosed diseases in my clinic, I find myself thinking about the work that I'm doing in the lab and to try to repurpose what we know in the lab to either diagnose or treat diseases that we know very little about. I feel that it's an incredible privilege to be a medical doctor and also be doing research because I get to bring my patients' experiences back into the lab. Being a doctor, I'm able to share with my team and the rest of the lab why the work we're doing is so important. The best part of my job is that I'm learning every day. I'm never bored. I'm working with a team who has a common goal to find new therapies for rare diseases. If you are somebody with a rare disease, it may often feel as if you are on an island by yourself, but I'm here to remind you that we are thinking of you. Even though each 
researcher and physician here may be studying only a handful of diseases, the purpose of a scientific community is so that when we come together and learn from each other, the growth is not just linear, but it's logarithmic. Very good, um, impressive work. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Mr. Frank Sasanowski, who's our featured afternoon guest uh, speaker. Uh, Frank has had an enormous impact on rare disease therapeutics that many of us might not be as aware of. He joined the FDA in 1983 as regulatory counsel in the Center for Drugs and Biologics, which have changed their names obviously since then, where he was a key to implementing both the 1983 orphan drug law and the 1984 Hatch-Waxman law, including our very own representative that includes UCLA. In 1987, he left the FDA as Deputy Director of Health Policy in the Commissioner's Office and joined the law firm of Hyman Phelps and McNamara, where he's continued to have an impact on rare disease uh, uh, processes for, for drug approvals. Over the course of his career, Frank has actually had an astonishing impact and has helped to secure uh, FDA approval for 100, uh, over 100 new drugs uh, including new molecular uh, entities for serious and rare genetic diseases. He was involved in six of the most recent eight drugs FDA approved by way of the accelerated approval pathway that has become possible and actually implemented with uh, real effect in the rare disease space during our, during actually recent years. In 2000, Frank was elected to the board of directors of NORD, where he served as chair and as vice chair and was on its board until 2016. In 2017, Frank joined the board of the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases, where he's currently its vice chair and having an impact again as we move forward with new therapeutics. Frank, we're so looking forward to hearing your life's work and please take the floor. Well, th thank you, Stan. It's, it's a dis real honor to be here at UCLA on your second annual Rare Disease Day. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, that uh, NORD, when I was at NORD, we made an effort to create the Rare Disease Day. We actually thought of it first as February 29th, because that's a rare day, it's leap year. And what it has morphed into is that it's really Rare Disease Week. It's the last week of February around the world. I'm going to be the keynote speaker at the, sec at the first ever Rare Disease Day in India on Monday. Um, and so it's really heartening to see all of the attention on rare diseases. Why? Could I go to the next slide, Jack? Uh, why is it so heartening to me? Because in 1983, when uh, your congressman, Henry Waxman, uh, your former congressman, but longtime congressman, when he was one of the co-champions, along with Orrin Hatch of Utah, of the Orphan Drug Act, which was signed into law by President Reagan, um, there was, I was involved with that. The, uh, it turns out that the law didn't really work so well. So the deputy commissioner of FDA asked me to investigate it. And I found that one of the things is there was no definition of an orphan drug or rare for rare diseases in the original law. And I called up, literally called up Henry Waxman on a rotary phone. I still remember at FDA. And, and we came up with the idea that if we had a bright line test, like 200,000, that would be a way to add clarity to what would be considered a rare disease. So, and, and every year it turns out there are more and more rare diseases uh, discovered. You heard both from Dan and Stan, all the great work being done at UCLA to do genetic screening. And that leads to discovery of more rare diseases. While each rare disease is something that you might not have ever known somebody with spinal muscular atrophy or Stan mentioned Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. But if you put all of them together, 25 to 30 million Americans have a rare disease. So while any one rare disease might be something that you will probably never encounter, it's almost impossible for you not to know somebody who has a rare disease. And when we talk about these rare diseases, 50% um, of rare diseases affect children, our children. 80% of them are genetic diseases. And so I'm really encouraged to hear all the work that Dan and Stan and UCLA are doing 
at, at looking both at uh, whole genome sequencing, looking at transcriptomes, being able to give us the tools to be able to diagnose genetic diseases. And when I put on my slide that more than 90% don't have an therapy, any kind of therapy, it's really over 95% don't have a therapy. And maybe what I don't have on my slide here is maybe the most discouraging thing. And that is something I heard Dan mention about the undiagnosed um, kind of network program that UCLA is involved with. And that is that we estimate within the rare disease community that it takes seven years for a person with a rare disease to get the right diagnosis. Um, I recently have had a family member who didn't get the right diagnosis for over 20 years. So it, it is one of the most frustrating parts because you know you are affected, but you don't know with what. And no one then can tell you how you should be modifying your lifestyle or what kind of other things that you should be considering. So next slide, Jack. So what I'd like to talk about is why am I optimistic about where we are today? Besides hearing from Dan and Stan about how the progress that is being made here at UCLA, if you look at the amount of research that's being done as measured just by the number of things that come to the FDA and ask for what's called orphan drug designation, being recognized as a therapy that's in development for a rare disease, you see the upward trend. And so it tells us then in the 40 years that I've been involved in this, almost 40 years that I've been involved in this activity, um, we went from a time in which 40 years ago, nobody ever talked about rare diseases. No one hardly ever did any research on rare diseases. And today, look, we have the second annual UCLA Rare Disease Day. We have two institutes at the UCLA that are dedicated to, to the patients with rare diseases. So I really wanna share with you some of the lessons that I've learned from my almost four decades in the trenches. Next slide, Jack. The first thing I wanted to share is some lessons from Dr. Janet Woodcock. Dr. Woodcock is now the principal deputy commissioner of FDA. For a year, she was the acting commissioner. And for maybe 20 years, she was head of the Center for Drugs. So in one of those, about five years ago, she and I were co-keynote speakers at a summit on rare diseases. And she exhorted everybody, everybody, researchers, scientists, caregivers, patients, to start thinking about how we can do trials with more visual evidence because we're a visual society. And just think about that. Some of the common tests you heard, uh, um, we do in neurology and psychiatry uh, and maybe even cardiology, things like a nine hole peg test or a six minute walk test looking for exercise uh, endurance and capacity. These kind of things, if you were to take a videotape at the beginning of a trial and at the end of the trial, or ask a patient to perform the, the two or three activities of daily living at the beginning, at the end, then you could have them read by a central blinded reader at the end, and you could do a ranking analysis to simply say who had the least amount of improvement or maybe the greatest deterioration over the period of the study duration, and who had ranked them all the way up to the person who had the greatest improvement, and then see if that ranked order would be due to chance more or less frequently than one in 20 times. So there are ways to use uh, visual evidence that we haven't really thought of. Next slide, Jack. And here's a principle, a good example. I helped with the approval of the first drug for spinal muscular atrophy. If you look at the child in the upper right-hand corner of this slide, that is a classic case of a person with type one uh, SMA. It, the, the common name that people call this is a floppy baby because a baby with type 1 SMA um, is never going to have any body turgor, will never be able to raise their head, will never be able to roll over, and certainly will never be able to sit unassisted. The pictures on the left, those nine pictures on the left, are nine of the first 12 patients who had a a experimental gene therapy called Zolgemza, which was approved in 2019. I first helped get the first 
anti-sense oligonucleotide Spinraza approved on December 23rd, 2016, signed by Dr. Woodcock. And then I immediately started helping on the gene therapy. And here are the children. And look at them all sitting up. The definition of a floppy baby is somebody who will never be able to sit up. And I want to point to the lower right-hand corner. I want to take you on a little journey with me. And that is, I'm at the Vatican in 2019. I'm talking, I'm speaking there. I flew over with Francis Collins and his wife. Uh, he was the head of the National Institutes of Health at the time. He had spent his life working on cracking the, the genetic code, which he did in 2000, a great accomplishment. But when I showed the slide of this little boy in the lower right-hand corner is a little boy, Mateo, who has type one SMA, he would never be able to roll over. Here he is, he got gene therapy, Solgemza experimental. Here he is at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio. He had walked down the hallway and was standing on tiptoes to press the up elevator button. And Francis Collins cried. He was in the front row at the Vatican, just like I am about to do now. That's the power of visual evidence. I mean, it's also the power of what we can do with research and what we can do to advance human health. But I'm also giving you an examples of a lesson learned in terms of visual evidence. We can go to the next slide. Another lesson from Dr. Woodcock is to look at seamless development, adaptive designs. Don't think of trying to develop a new therapy by looking at sequences of a phase one study and stopping and then a phase two study and stopping and recruiting new people in phase three. She says, try to get people into a natural history, into a registry. And you're going to hear more about that later, about the rare X registry. But, and then try to take people and continue them. If you have them randomized into a single ascending dose trial or a, a, an SAD trial or a multiple ascending dose trial, a MAD trial, and then take the same patient and put them into your phase two or three trial if you can. Let's try to break down the silos and try to care more for each patient and try to use their heroic um, spirit to volunteer to participate in trials and make greater efficiency and use of that. Next slide, please. If we look at the role of patient advocates in the drug approval process, it's changed dramatically even over my lifetime. The first US drug law in 1902 never mentioned the word patient because I guess there was no thought that a patient was relevant to any consideration of developing new medicines. And in fact, it wasn't till almost over a hundred years later that the first federal law mentioned the word patient in it with respect to medicines. That's pretty remarkable to me that all this time, what was being done is it was almost as though patients were the beneficiaries of the activities of researchers and scientists and industry and federal regulators who didn't really see a role at the table for patients to participate in the drug development process. I have been forcefully speaking out to bring the patient into the drug development sphere. In fact, Francis Collins, Janet Woodcock, and I were invited about 20 years ago to be the three speakers to spend a weekend with the vice presidents of the biggest pharma companies at a resort, of course. And, and my talk 20 years ago was, um, pay attention to the rising voice of the patient. And, and I've been um, kind of on this um, kind of platform, speaking and encouraging people to use patient-centered drug development. Look at the next slide. And here's why I want, I think it's so important. I helped get the first drug approved for Huntington's disease. It was a drug called tetrabenazine. And we looked at chorea, which is kind of a movement disorder. That was a very good thing. But when I helped get that approved in August, 2008, it was what neurologists thought was the most important thing to patients. When the Huntington's Disease Society of America did a survey of 200 neurologists and 200 Huntington's disease patients, they found 
that the doctors all thought, and this was presented at an FDA meeting that I was at in September 2015, all the doctors thought that the number one thing that bothered patients the most was this chorea, this shaking. I have a son with Tourette's. I have to tell you that his tics, his shaking, doesn't bother him. It might bother other people, but it doesn't bother him. With Huntington's, what bothered patients was cognition, the effect that Huntington's had on their cognitive abilities, because that meant how they could perform in school, whether or not they could hold a job. And I give you some other examples on this slide. Disclaimer, I don't read everything on my slides. I kind of use them as backdrops. And maybe you can, if you want to go back and read them and you have a takeaway that you can refer to later, because we have too much to talk about to read everything on each slide. Jack, can you go to the next slide? So the FDA did something very novel, and that is when that word patient was first introduced into our drug laws in 2012, one of the things it required is that the FDA was going to hold meetings with patients who have different diseases, and it was supposed to hold 20 meetings over five years. After the FDA did that, the FDA said, this is a very good thing. We're learning a lot, but we don't have time to do it. We will let patient groups on their own create what are called externally led patient focused drug development meetings. There have been, my slide needs to be updated. There have been over 40 of these uh, since that time. Our firm has been involved, my firm, and over 30 of them in, in putting them together. And let me illustrate how important they are. You'll see in the middle of this slide, there's a funny word phrase called epidermolosa bullosa. I'm gonna show you on the next slide some examples of that. Jack, if you can go to the next slide. I was called in fall of 28, 2017 by the patient organization representing all patients with this rare disease. Epidemiolosa bullosa is sometimes called the butterfly disease because it's diagnosed at birth. A, a newborn comes out of the womb. And in fact, there's the, the nurse usually or midwife in cleaning the newborn the skin might begin to fall off the child because there's no adhesion. So it's called the butterfly disease because the skin is as fragile as a butterfly wing. So when the patient organization that represents all the people in the country with this disease, EB, called me to say, Frank, we'd like to give you a lifetime achievement award. I said, you know, when I get lifetime achievement awards for my work, it's because I've helped get the first drug in that disease approved. I'm not even helping on EB. I don't even know EB. And they said, Frank, all the work you do and all the rare diseases encourages people to do more research. And so we recognize that a rising tide raises all boats and you've helped us, even though you don't know us. I said, that's fine. I will come and accept your award under one condition. I not sit with your board of directors. I not sit with anybody from industry, but I sit with patients. So I learned something. They sat me between the two little girls. You can see how devastating this disease is. These little girls are just like, they're almost wrapped like mummies. That's why you'll see little Ella on the left and Raffi on the right. You see Raffi's legs, they're all wrapped in white. You, if you don't see, you see Ella's got her hands in because she's lost the fingertips of her hands and their fingers were fused together like polydactyl. So I learned about this disease. And I went back and I talked to the FDA and I said, you know what I learned? I learned that you FDA are requiring that to get a drug approved, you, the drug would have to show that patients with this condition have a score of zero or one. That is their lesions are completely cleared or nearly completely cleared. I said, I'm a devout Catholic. If I took Raffi and Ella to Lourdes, they're never going to get to zero or one. Your standard is way too high. So the FDA said, Frank, why don't you set up one of these externally led patient focused drug development meetings that I just talked about in the last slide? We set it up. The FDA sent their top three people in dermatology to the meeting, stayed all day. That was April of 2018. And without the community, without the patients ever even asking the FDA, the FDA on its own initiative came out with a guidance document very soon after that, like two months later, and they never, ever said you have to have a standard like they had been telling people before this. 
because they learned about the disease. So that's how important the patient voice is. Next slide, Jack. Um, so each patient is precious too, and we should glean as much information from each patient who heroically participates. So you can do things that are very patient-centric. That is, is not a burden on a patient to ask them a single question, like how is, what is the severity of your disease at baseline and at the end of the study? Very simple, five or seven point Likert scale can give you a lot of information. There are other things like looking at the most troublesome symptom. Instead of many diseases, especially rare diseases, present themselves in a heterogeneous manifestation of symptoms. That is, every patient won't have the thing, the same thing that bothers them the most. So you can let everybody decide for themselves at the baseline, what is the most important symptom to you? For instance, on migraine, we know that migraine is not rare, but I'm using it as an example because the FDA has published a guidance on this, that when you ask about migraine, you know pain is going to be the most important symptom, but the FDA won't allow an opioid to be approved for pain for migraine. So the FDA says you have to prove an effect on something else, photophobia, phonophobia, that is light or sound sensitivity or nausea or vomiting. But you can let a person, it doesn't matter what their most important, second most important symptom is, let them all in and let them define it at baseline. So you, you try to use patients, select patients and use them for as much as you can because it's really important what each patient brings to the table. Next slide. For instance, at the very first FDA rare disease day that was held in the great hall of the FDA building, um, it turns out here is uh, Tiffany House who has Pompeii disease. She is speaking and what she did is she became embedded in the FDA review team. And what the FDA reviewers afterwards when I talked to them told me they learned from having her a patient as part of their team is that she taught them they were looking for a drug to have an improvement, that is to show some improvement from baseline, from the start of the trial to the end, how much did a patient improve? What she taught them is that you're thinking of it entirely wrong. You have to look for a uniformly progressive disease like Pompeii and like so many rare diseases. The best day of a person is the day they're diagnosed. And every day after that, they're gonna get worse. So she said it's very important to be stable, to be as stable as possible. So that was a mind shift for the FDA and that allowed them to approve myozyme, the first drug for, uh, for Pompeii. If you, if you squint your eyes real hard at the slide, you'll see there's a guy with his head down and a red tie, that's me. I was gonna speak right after Tiffany. Next slide, Jack. Another one from patient advocates and, and Stan mentioned that he's one of, he and the, in the UCLA Center for Rare Diseases as a leader in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. The first drug approved for muscular dystrophy was a Teplersen, and I had a major hand in, in that approval. And what I did is I helped organize the patient voice. I organized uh, the JET Foundation to try to present their information to the FDA from a patient perspective. And I asked to have a meeting with the senior people at the FDA led by Dr. Woodcott. And I sat next to her with the patients without the company present. I wanted the patients to speak freely without having had any rehearsal with the industry, without having any contact with the industry, but I wanted to teach the FDA about DMD. Next slide, please. What we did then is I also asked the company, Sarepta, who I was representing, to give part of their time to the patient voice. And it was the first time in history that a, any company has ever allowed a patient to speak during their core presentation. And I made sure that the company had no control over what she was gonna say. So she was gonna speak purely for the patients. Next slide, please. An example of what she presented is that uh, Mindy Leffler um, just tracked her son, Aiden, uh, with his Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And she was counting how many times he spontaneously fell. Now, I'm not talking about tripping and falling. I'm talking about little Aiden would be standing and the next minute be on the floor and he would be shocked. Like, why did I collapse? And so she would track these daily. And you look where they started the drug. And then what happened when she was tracking daily, you know, how many times he spontaneously fell. And this was not part of the trial, but this was more 
what we would call anecdotal evidence, but it helped convince Janet Woodcock to approve a Teplerson. So the next slide. So it helped show that the changes on dystrophin, which was the surrogate basis for the approval, showing that it increased the amount of this important protein, uh, which allowed muscles to contract, that, that there were some clinical correlates for the underlying change in dystrophin levels. And that allowed Dr. Woodcock to approve the drug. Next slide. It turns out, what I also wanted to bring as another lesson is that what I've seen over my nearly 40 years is that the first drug in an area doesn't have to be perfect. When I helped FDA create something called the accelerated approval process, it was in response to the AIDS crisis in the 1980s. What we had was a terrible situation. Up to 50,000 Americans were dying each year from AIDS. So what we at FDA did is we said, you know, we don't have to show that a drug has a benefit. We can show that it simply is reasonably likely to have a benefit based upon a showing on a biomarker, a surrogate, that is reasonably likely to predict that benefit. The first drug like that approved was in 1987, AZT. There were two others approved after that that formed a three-drug cocktail, or antiretroviral cocktail, which led to changing AIDS from a death sentence to a chronic condition. The first drug that was ever used for this new system of looking at a surrogate instead of clinical benefit was beta seron. It was the first drug for MS. And yes, I was involved in that one. And the person who signed the approval was Janet Woodcock. I don't know what's going to happen when Janet and I leave. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But, but what happened was many people thought it was very controversial because it was Based, its approval was based upon a single trial instead of two. Science usually likes two. It was a single trial. And guess what? It had a co-primary endpoints and it failed one of its two co-primary co endpoints. So it was a single trial that was a failed trial. And yet I thought that there was enough evidence for approval because we also looked at MRI lesion volume, a surrogate, and that was very impressive. So the FDA, Janet Woodcock, approved it. What has happened since then? Now there are more than a dozen multiple sclerosis drugs looking at different targets. So the same thing, we talked about DMD, a Teplerson, that drug uh, that was approved in 2016. Since that time, and that was very controversial. In fact, I think that approval and the next one I'm going to mention, Adjahelm, which is for Alzheimer's, which is not a rare disease, obviously. But Ateplerson and Adjahelm are probably the two most controversial drugs maybe that FDA has ever approved. And, and yet with Ateplerson, we now have four more DMD drugs and representing two classes, even a steroid in Flaza. So the first drug, go to the next slide, please. The Jack, the, uh, so what I'm saying is that the first drug that's approved in an, in an area like a rare disease where there's nothing else out there, it's a very serious life-threatening condition where there's no therapy. The first one doesn't have to be perfect because by getting a drug out there to address the suffering of our sisters and brothers, it, it puts a spotlight on that disease and happens to stimulate more research and encourages more investment in that disease because other people can see there's a path forward. Next slide. And I think that what UCLA is doing so brilliantly here is it's learning to look at genetic precision. We heard Dan talk about precision medicine. We heard Stan talk about the Center for Rare Diseases relying upon all of the, the um, genetic screening that's going on here. There are 65,000 patients that have been screened at UCLA, genetically screened. Um, I think Stan mentioned in August 2020, they started a program with Regeneron that now has 41,000 who have been screened in their biobank. This is fantastic work. And you can see, I use the example here of the, what I talked about earlier of SMA. You know, if you just look from the time that the SMA gene was discovered, until the time when we had two drugs approved, first an antisense oligonucleotide and then Zolgemza. And you're gonna hear from a, a, a very learned uh, physician from Roche about a third drug approved from SMA later in today's talk. But this shows the, how important genetic precision can be. And uh, I wanna go to the next slide, Jack, and just say why I'm so optimistic about the future. When I see 
when I started with this and I called Henry Waxman in 1983 and said, you know, we have to improve the law you just passed, you know, and President Reagan signed because it's not working. And we talked about how to improve it. Nobody in the world was really talking about rare diseases. And today I see UCLA as a home, a university home to multiple institutes and initiatives and really caring for patients with rare disease. And I see all the efforts going on in this community. It reminds me that I want to leave you with the next slide. And that is that when I went to meet with the Pope and, and I told him about the work I did on a rare disease, Ben Chagas, Chagas is a rare disease that kills more in his native Ar Argentina than malaria. And the Pope was so impressed, you know, that he ended up giving me a pontifical hero award. But what that's not important. Here's what's important. What I asked Pope Francis to do is to give a blessing <laughs> on all of our sisters and brothers around the world who are afflicted and suffering with rare diseases and on all of us who are caring for them, all the scientists and researchers and physicians who are caring for patients who are suffering with rare diseases. And so he gave me that papal blessing as a representative of you. And so that papal blessing he gave me has been conveyed to you. And I just want to end on that note, knowing that each of you has a papal blessing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. Thank you. That was a lovely talk. We appreciate it very much. So we're going to move to our next panel. I think that's very enlightening and very, uh, you know, sort of respectful of a very long period of time working to try to make this world work a little bit easier and simpler. Uh, so I'm going to now turn to our next portion of the program, which is I'm turning things over to Dr. Carrie Michelli, who will moderate our expert panel. Dr. Michelli is a professor in the Department of Microbiology, Immunology, and Molecular Genetics and the founding co-director of the Center for Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy at UCLA. Carrie, handing it to you. Oh, thank you, Stan. And thanks, Frank, for um, your insights and especially for your hard work. It's really been meaningful to all of us. I'm pleased to be here today to facilitate the panel discussion. And as Dr. Nelson shared, I'm a professor of microbiology, immunology, and molecular genetics and a founding co-director of the Center for Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy, which serves as a paradigm on campus for integrating translational science, clinical care, trials, and advocacy to accelerate progress in rare disease discovery and therapeutics. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Valerie Arbolita, Assistant Professor of Pathology, Human Genetics, and Computational Medicine. Valerie studies how both rare and common genetic variation causes human disease and is known for discovering the Tham Arbolita syndrome, a rare disease that impairs intellectual and physical development. Charlene Sun Rigby, CEO of RareX. Charlene has a deep experience in the rare disease space, both from the tech life sciences industry and now from an advocacy organization. Like me, when her child was diagnosed with a rare genetic disease, she was motivated to turn her efforts to expediting development of therapeutics for rare diseases. Lastly, we're joined by Catherine Wagner, Vice President and Global Head of Neuromuscular Diseases at La Roche, where she's involved in therapeutic development for a range of neuromuscular disorders. And prior to joining Roche, Dr. Wagner was an academic physician scientist who cared for children and adults with muscular dystrophies. Thank you all for being here today with us today. The focus of our time together is for you to share from your own perspective how each of you play different but complementary roles in rare disease discovery, therapeutic development, and moving new treatments to the market. With that as your foundation, I'd like to start by asking each of you to touch on what brought you to this work and the part you see yourself playing in this important continuum. Dr. Arbolita, let's start with you. What brought you to this work and why academia? You know, so I started in research as a, when I was in medical school. Um, I was working in the labs of Eric Villain and Stan Nelson, and this was at the time when we were just starting to be able to sequence parts of genomes, let alone whole genomes. At, at that time, we were really, that, that technology for the discovery of causal mutations in rare disease was just coming online and maturing. And so as a graduate student, it really um, served as a springboard. It was a, an amazing time in genetics and genomics. and um, being able to sequence chunks of DNA, so I'm talking about like millions of base pairs rather than was, was a huge um, 
just a huge improvement on what you could do um, with family studies. And I was fortunate enough to have a number of uh, projects looking at large families and trying to pin down the exact causal mutation. And so, you know, we started with a couple of rare diseases in which we identified a novel cause and, and we're starting to think about how we might uh, use this these findings to think about disease treatments. And since then, I haven't really stopped thinking about genetics and genomics. And, and the thing about discovery, at least as far as finding that, genet that gene that causes a disease, is that first discovery is really just the tip of the iceberg. You, you think about these questions, and it starts to make you think a little bit more about those molecular mechanisms in the cell, the things that you can't see with the naked eye, and how this one change in a gene can really cause a host of clinical phenotypes and ultimately lead to disease. And so it's that direct connection um, from finding something in the lab, and then so often I've met a lot of the patients in whom we've done these diagnoses in, um, that, that really kind of drive what I think about every day. And as I've gone on um, and finished my training and, and started my own lab, I've started to really think about the conditions that I'm, I'm curious about and how we can improve the lives of the patients um, who are so generous as to provide samples for us to study. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Wagner, the same question to you. What brought you to this field? Hi. Um, similar to Valerie, I think that um, what initially brought me uh, to rare diseases and for me to, to muscular dystrophy was a, an intellectual um, curiosity and, and work in the laboratory. Uh, during my PhD years, I, I cloned a gene that is very similar to um, the gene uh, that is uh, mutated and causes Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And it was also a time where there were uh, multiple uh, genes being discovered that, that caused other types of muscular dystrophy. So, so it, was, it was a very um, exciting time in uh, the laboratory. Uh, but then I went back uh, to finish my uh, medical training and um, met patients with uh, muscular dystrophy and uh, really became drawn to them uh, in another way, uh, you know, really from my heart. And, um, you know, they're just an extraordinary patient population. Um, individuals with uh, neuromuscular diseases um, are diverse, such as the rest of, of, of uh, the world, but they frequently share a weakness of, of muscle and a fortitude of, of spirit. Well, uh, thank you, Catherine. I know that uh, your patients all love you as well. <laughs> uh, Charlene, yeah, you're next up. And can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you've dedicated your career to rare disease? Yeah, thanks, Carrie. So I've spent the last 20 years building software solutions for the analysis of big data, both healthcare data um, as well as enterprise data. And Prior to RareX, I was uh, the chief business officer of Fabric Genomics, where we developed artificial intelligence approaches to speed the diagnosis of patients through genomics. Um, and as you had mentioned in the introductions, um, uh, most importantly, I'm the mom um, to an eight-year-old girl, Juno, who has a rare neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, and we um, you know, took a three-year journey to find an answer for what her um, challenges were. And you know, I feel very fortunate that we were able to get a diagnosis for her in 2016 through whole exome testing. Um, and a year later, I co-founded the STXBP1 Foundation to advance development of meaningful precision therapies for kids like, um, kids like my daughter. Um, Last year, I joined RareX and I'm highly motivated by the mission. Um, I believe that RareX really has the ability to break through some of the key challenges that I became aware of as we work to initiate natural history studies and data collection in my daughter's rare disease. Um, when my daughter was diagnosed, um, in 2016, there were only a couple hundred kids in the world who had been diagnosed. And so we started to figure out, well, how can we collect meaningful data on our patients to start to really uh, characterize and understand the disease progression? 
So um, when I was speaking with other patient advocacy groups from other disorders, I was really struck that we were all creating very similar things um, in different systems and learning um, parallel lessons that, um, uh, but learning them in different ways. And it really struck me as somebody who had a software background that there's such a huge opportunity cost in um, you know, this kind of bespoke process when there are already so few resources within rare disease and such an urgency in terms of trying to get to therapies you know, for our loved ones. Um, as you know, there there's only about 5% of rare diseases that have an approved therapy. And so there's a huge unmet need across many, I mean, basically almost all of our patient populations. Well, thanks. Um, and again, thanks for your work. Uh, Valerie, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your role at a public academic medical center in terms of discovery, therapy development, clinical trials? What's it like for you? No. My role as a, as, a, as a physician scientist is I'm, I'm a pathologist by training. And so I really focus and my, my expertise is around diagnostics there and also thinking about therapeutic biomarkers. And so the way I see um, my, my purpose in academia with respect to rare disease is that academia is a great place for discovery. It's good for asking questions at the very basic level, even if you're not really sure um, what the outcome is gonna be. I always have a clear, goal in mind and that if we're we're using patient derived samples to create patient models and figure out try and figure out a mechanism and by mechanism that's sort of that gateway to drug development and identifying targetable uh, targetable parts of the cell um, so we're really trying to to do that initial discovery phase which it, which I think is always grounded in this idea that we will eventually get to a treatment, but not like necessarily that's the, I, the only goal. The goal is to sort of an understanding of the biology of the cell. Um, and so that's on the molecular level, that's where I focus my efforts on thinking about biomarkers, thinking about um, target therapeutic targets. Um, and then the other thing I work a lot with is as we're discovering these new, um, this new disorders as we work with patient groups and try to think about how we might to encourage the development of natural history studies and kind of help um, patients think about how to collect phenotypes and better understand the clinical manifestations of disease. Um, because ultimately that's, that's also one of the challenges in rare disease is that they're rare. And so um, finding enough patients to power a clinical trial or even a small molecular study um, is, is one of the major challenges. For the partnership, I think with uh, rare disease organizations and with industries is critical because you need that infrastructure um, to, for the drug development piece to optimize that. That's not something that's um, easily done, at least for, for me. It's not where my expertise lies. So that partnerships, I think, is critical. And then the partnership with the family groups, because you can't, if you find something, um, but the family groups don't, it's not, it's not the end goal or you're not sort of, um, vested in what the families are, are needing or what they need or what their main um, concerns are, you might have found something that may not actually address the needs, um, the needs of, the, of, these, of these families. Um, and so to me that all those things are critical to kind of come together um, and trying to get them to come together in parallel rather than sequentially for the, for the purposes of time. So that's, that's where I see my role as an academic to really um, think about the, that early stage of discovery. Thanks. Catherine, you're unique in that you've um, worked in academia, advocacy, and now in, in, in industry. And, and perhaps you can give us your perspective about what each of these uh, bring to the table and where the gaps are and how they can be best addressed. Well, I, I really appreciate this question because each, um, each group has a critical role to play. And without any one, I don't think we would be successful in developing drugs for rare disorders. So in academia, I do believe, um, as, as Valerie uh, was uh, mentioning, that um, most of the fundamental biological insights um, have, uh, have resulted uh, from work by academic scientists. And uh, most individuals with rare diseases are treated at academic medical centers by physician scientists. So academia brings to the table the understanding of the disease phenotype, uh, pathogenesis, and in many cases, the, the drug uh, targets. 
The clinical trials of, of rare diseases are, are usually conducted at academic medical centers where the treated physician with disease expertise is often the site PI. Advocacy is the voice of the patient um, telling us what symptoms are important to address, what clinical trial outcome measures are relevant, what trial schedules and procedures are feasible versus overly burdensome, et cetera. Um, so advocacy groups educate drug developers in crucial ways, beginning with just bringing visibility uh, to their diseases. They also educate families affected by rare diseases. Uh, um, what is a clinical trial? What clinical trials are available and appropriate uh, for them, et cetera. And advocacy groups play a key role in providing seed money and, and often a lot more than just mere seeds uh, to disease research. This encourages more laboratory and clinical research in their disease area and encourages more investigators, many of whom get started in a disease area with a small grant from a patient uh, foundation. So I, I could continue on and on about the very important and wonderful thing that advocacy brings to the table. I'm relatively new to industry, but I've been extremely impressed with the depth of knowledge that pharma has and how to bring a preclinical finding uh, to an approved drug. So critically, industry teams generate and refine chemicals or biological reagents capable of selectively modulating targets, which then serve as leads for iterative drug development of core industry expertise. Industry also has additional expertise that is critical to successful drug development, including toxicology, drug metabolism, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, formulation, delivery, regulatory affairs. And the people in industry really know how to design and conduct a clinical trial to fully evaluate safety and efficacy in a disease population. They then know how to analyze that data and refine their approach or proceed in a very strategic and efficient way to regulatory approval. However, the process of bringing new drugs to patients doesn't end with regulatory approval. And this is where I see one major gap. The, the use of the drug in the real world setting, of course, is what affects patients. And this is dependent on access and patient and physician acceptance of the drug. Um, Collecting real-world data and shaping access and, and acceptance are important activities that we are collectively not putting enough emphasis on for rare diseases. Now, I think a prominent example is in the growing area of gene therapy, where therapeutics are tested predominantly in a subset of the population that tends to be racially and ethnically homogeneous with higher socioeconomic status. So I think academia, advocacy, and industry need to work together to bring these novel medications to all people with rare diseases who could benefit from them. Well, thanks, Catherine. I think we uh, will all benefit from your many hats that you have worn and continue to wear. Uh, Valerie, what do you see as uh, the challenges presented currently in sort of a translational research environment? You know, I think Translational research is a, a, a right now, or at least to me, a little bit fragmented. And I, it's fragmented, it's good because I think you need these um, different groups working together. But the getting something that you find in the lab preclinically into um, getting the interest of, of pharma companies, usually the rare disease family groups that I've worked with are, are kind of thrilled with uh, any, any discovery um, and, and trying to gauge that interest and kind of get it into the right hands to the right people who are who are the experts in designing the trials, doing the medicinal chemistry to optimize any compound that would be used is, is maybe one of the um, more challenging parts. But here, um, one of the hard parts too is also rapid testing and turnaround time. Like from the time we identify a new disorder, um, in the past it's taken several decades to get to a treatment, but now we are able to more rapidly diagnose genet people genetically um, but still that turnaround time to identifying a mechanism and getting it up through all these trials, I think that's, um, that's where the work is really hard to get through that, um, to get enough of these uh, rare diseases studied and through the pipeline and studied in an effective way. I mean, it's hard to 
get these studies going because you need often patient samples and you need a, a dedicated basic scientist who's looking critically at those mechanisms. And I think, um, I know a lot of the rare disease groups are thinking about trying to engage researchers to study their disease, um, even though they don't necessarily have um, all the resources to do so because um, because be, and research is expensive. So um, at the end of the day, we, we try to find these mechanisms, um, but if there's no way to set up to, to get them through into um, a compound that would be effective. And then most more importantly, there's no way to find a biomarker to trace the efficacy of these drugs that we're developing, to think about that natural history and how it's affecting a natural history um, for that rare disease. Um, it's, it's almost impossible, I would say, and, and Dr. Wagner knows better, um, to design a good clinical trial if you don't have um, sort of endpoints or, or milestones that you need to, you can measure, accurately measure. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot going on in a lot of these rare disease spaces and each rare disease is unique to itself, but then also has a lot of different, um, it's a spectrum of phenotypes. So all the rare disease patients in my mind are, are somewhat unique to themselves because they don't all present in the exact same ways. I mean, we don't really understand even why that is the case. So. Uh -huh. And then so for advocacy and pharma, from your perspective as an academic, uh, how does the the unification of all three of these disciplines uh, help in addressing these challenges? I think each piece plays a critical role to make sure that the family needs get addressed uh, through advocacy. And ad and to me, the advocacy groups have really helped my research and that their um, family groups are incredibly um, enthusiastic about donating samples if we need samples for study. Um, don't filling out surveys for to understand sort of the the for, we started with clinical phenotypes what that spectrum of clinical phenotype is and and just donating some of their uh, medical information and providing it to us so that we could do large scale analyses um, having one or two patients in the literature you can't really make um, an assessment about what the true spectrum of disease is and it's really only been in the last ten years that you can. You can now identify a lot of patients and then you can bring them together with social media. So the family groups are, are sort of self congregating um, on Facebook, at least uh, many of the ones that I'm, I'm uh, in contact with, so that they can sort of crowdsource information in a way that was impossible probably 50, 10, 15 years ago. So I think that partnership with advocacy groups kind of helps me think about what um, what the priorities are for the families and also sort of what things they've tried as far as um, sort of more natural remedies, we'll say. Um, and then with pharma, I, I have less experience in that space because I've not gone through a preclinical, like have, have nothing that's preclinical, but ultimately that's the goal. Um, and, and I think there's, it, it's it's a challenge from, from, I wouldn't say a regulatory standpoint, but there's just a lot, there's a lot of um, boxes to be checked to make sure until something is able to go to that, um, preclinical to something that's ready for drug development. Thanks. Charlene, from your perspective, um, how do you see the biggest challenges facing uh, the rare disease community now? Um, well, maybe I can start and just give a little bit of background on RareX and how that kind of connects with, you know, some of the gaps that we see. So, you know, we, um, are and this conversation, I've just loved how there's, you know, kind of this true intersection between academia and, you know, industry and advocacy. And I've been very, very heartened by um, Valerie and Catherine's um, remarks coming from a patient advocate perspective. Um, and, you know, really at RareX, you know, that's where we started was with the perspective of the patients and, you know, what is needed to accelerate therapies. Um, so we've developed this platform to enable patient communities to gather structure and share patient level data, um, you know, to accelerate research, you know, both that kind of basic characterization of a disorder as well as really accelerating, uh, you know, future cures. And um, I, I think that one of the, you know, going to this question about gaps, um, you know, so we know that in any individual rare disease, there are really very small numbers of patients for any disorder. And so 
um, it's very critical that we maximize that you know, just, you, the utility of that data. Um, I think that Frank called it precious data um, uh, given by you know these patients and. Um, you know, coming from a rare disorder where, you know, my daughter, you know, now there's over a thousand patients, but, you know, it's still very, very small. And it's a real moral imperative for us, I think, to really maximize the utility of that data. And um, the challenge is that traditionally healthcare systems, you know, as well as research studies have generated silos of data. Um, and it's been very difficult to bridge and integrate those data sets. Um, and this is exacerbated by the fact that you, rare disease patients, you know, rare disease does not discriminate. Uh, you know, there are patients around the world and, um, you know, the way that that um, access to research studies and um, institutions is often limited by um, by geographic reach and, and proximity. And so, um, you know, we, in rare disease, especially, we need to really break down these silos and these impediments to sharing data. Um, so one part of the solution is redefining consent. Um, traditional consents for research programs have often limited the use of data to the initial research study, um, which is obviously a big issue if we want to maximize the utility of that data. Um, what RareX has done is, is that we have a broad research consent that allows participants to change their data sharing preferences at any time. Um, a second area is um, redefining proprietary. So understanding patient symptoms, the spectrum of patients, the you know, patient experience, um, disease progression, you know, I feel that this should all be pre-competitive because not sharing this data slows progress um, in terms of therapy development and understanding our patient populations. And you know, I think that there's a growing understanding that drug development companies have that um, they're going to be able to differentiate based on their technology and their ability to move drugs through um, a, an approval pipeline, not based on natural history data um, that they have. And uh, what I have been, what we have been seeing at RareX is that forward-looking pharma understand this. Um, and what we need to do, I think, is move this pre-competitive uh, model to become the norm instead of the exception. I think that public-private partnerships are really key to this adoption. And I, I think, I just wanna chime in there because I know, Charlene, you've done a lot of this work in this space. And I know it was a, one of the big roadblocks we ran into when I was working with um, the CAT6A syndrome or Arboleta Fam syndrome. Um, we really were, when we first started reaching out to patient groups and also to other physicians, we wanted to bring together and identify all the patients to identify what the full spectrum of disease phenotypes were. And I remember we went through, we, we wrote the paper, we had 70 some patients in it and some families, uh, we, we published it and maybe like a, a year later, there were a number of clinicians who, maybe one or two, who, who came up to me and said, you published my patient as if they had some ownership over that data. And I said, well, the patient found us through the rare disease, their advocacy groups, and it's their data. And you know, the richness of the, the, the data set that we were able to collect when we collected it directly from the parents was, I think, on a whole nother level than when we were going through the clinicians. And the clinicians are fantastic, but, you know, you, you kind of, if when you, we always open up a free form area at the end and sort of let families say what, what their concerns are, what, what they notice that they're not, well, I'm not sure if this is part of the disease, but this happens a lot. And so what we realized when we, when we reported the first four cases, we thought it was a very similar, quite severe disorder. But what we realized over um, the 70 patients that we then phenotyped is that it's actually a very, a varied spectrum with a lot of um, sort of clinical diversity. And that's why it's, it had been really hard to de uh, describe up front. And so now as we're thinking about these spectrums of disorders, it makes it harder to think about what, what do you track if you're trying to do a clinical study for efficacy of a drug? And so I've really started encouraging the patient groups to think about this need for a natural history study. Like how do you measure severity of disease with some biomarker that actually changes if you treat a patient, not genetic DNA, because that's sort of immutable. It's uh, that's there. But if you are looking at something like mar markers in the blood that change with response to a drug, that would be sort of the ideal target. It's um, you know, it's something that's quantifiable. It's easy to measure. Um, it's a blood draw, but it's easier to measure than um, some clinical phenotype that may have a little bit more um, 
bias and, and who's measuring it and how and when and what time of day, things like that. Um, so I, I really think that this question of data sharing, especially in the beginning, is, is a critical piece for the rare disease groups. And, and I think any rare disease group that has worked with me knows that I always say, keep your data, try and find a place. I know it's hard because it's really hard to manage a red cap registry. It's hard to manage even like um, even the data that we collected. It was hard to give it back to the patients in some in an easy way. So, but it's I think a critical need um, as we move into clinical trials. Yeah, I just really want to respond. Please. Um, uh, I, I I absolutely agree with you, Valerie, and I want to respond to you know uh, something that you said at the beginning of your story, which is you know this whole aspect of you know ownership of data, and you know the the what I think the, um, in terms of a paradigm shift is really enabling patients to have a seat at the research table, and you know they're bringing their data. Um, which you know you recognized in um, you know in 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 your study and you know at we believe um, at RareX that you know patients really do own their data. We are you know facilitating their ability to share that data with research um, you know for the purposes of research and for the purpose of accelerating um, you know accelerating the um, the research process and to do it in a way that enables them to have that true seat at the table, but deburdening them from having to, um, you know, yeah. manage that <laughs> research protocol, exactly the IRB, you know, mm -hmm. and all of, um, you know, becoming an expert in data governance, which, you know, is, um, you know, is a career unto itself. Yeah. And so, um, you know, so I, I think that that's fundamental in terms of, you know, being able to really um, accelerate progress for all of these individual disorders. I really appreciated what you had to say also about uh, uh, broad consent. That's something Dr. Nelson's been doing for a while now is having very broad consents so, so that those of us who are doing experiments or running biobanks have the opportunity to use tissues or clinical data for unanticipated needs. And I think it really has uh, accelerated things here on campus for sure. Uh, Catherine, for the fun question now, what do you think is the biggest success to date in rare disease? So I might be a little biased as a neuromuscular clinician, but I would say the, the, the biggest success uh, in rare diseases in the past few years has been the treatment of spinal muscular atrophy. Um, as, as Frank um, described and showed pictures of, um, just a few years ago, babies with type 1 SMA inevitably never learned to sit, roll, crawl, stand, walk, and died within the first uh, few years of life. And individuals with other types of SMA similarly had no disease modifying treatments. Now there are three approved drugs for the whole spectrum of SMA disease. Um, and treated type 1 SMA babies are not only surviving, but thriving. Um, and this success really was the result of a partnership between academia, advocacy, and industry. And I think that's created the template now for future successes in, in rare diseases. Thanks, Catherine. I think we're going to stop with that. We're running out of time, but I really want to thank you all for sharing your thoughts and experiences. And um, it's really very clear that there's real power in integrating the patient voice with industry and academic endeavors. And we hope that discussions like this will accelerate better outcomes across the entire rare disease space. Thanks again, you all for participating. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm pleased to turn it over to Nagmi Durrani to moderate our discussion on genetic counseling at UCLA. Nagme is a health sciences associate clinical professor for the Department of Pediatrics and associate director of UCLA's master's in genetic counseling within the Department of Human Genetics. She provides comprehensive genetic counseling services as part of UCLA's medical genetics team in pediatrics and adult clinical genetics. Her expertise is in counseling and communicating with patients on matters of clinical genetics. Additionally, Nagme has experience in coordinating clinical genetic studies, teaching and supervising medical students, residents, fellows, and genetic counselors for the past 20 years. Thank you, Dr. Michali, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for giving us your time. Um, before we start, uh, I'd like to take a few minutes um, and give you some general information about um, what is it that you know, genetic counselors do and who we are. 
Genetic counselors are um, healthcare professionals who have specialized education in the field of medical genetics and counseling. Using family history, a genetic counselor will assess individual or family risk um, of an inherited condition. Uh, genetic counselors um, educate patients and professionals about genetic diseases and genetic testing options. We also advise uh, patients on the social and ethical issues uh, associated with the genetic disorder or genetic test result. Um, and we also help patients cope with the diagnosis of a genetic disease. In the United States, um, most genetic counselors have a master's degree and are certified through the American Board of um, Genetic Counseling. In 2020, uh, UCLA launched a master's degree program in genetic counseling and recently welcomed our second class of 10 incredible students. This is um, a highly sought out training program and is a high priority for the UCLA Institute for Precision Health and California Center for Rare Diseases. Um, students graduating from this program will feed the pipeline of counselors at UCLA and across the nation. Uh, at UCLA, we are lucky to have 13 skilled um, genetic counselors who are specialized in different areas of medicine, um, such as prenatal and preconception, cardiology, cancer, pediatrics, and research. Uh, today, I'm pleased uh, to introduce to you two of our genetic counselors. They will share with you their journey with patients and families. And during the diagnosis and the treatment of rare diseases. Marina Dutra Clark um, is a board certified uh, genetic counselor and licensed in California. She received her master's in science in genetic counseling from University of California in Irvine. She worked at UCLA in the Department of Pediatrics for the past four years. Her role at UCLA has a focus on chromosome 22Q disorders, hearing loss, genetics of kidney diseases, and general pediatrics. Marina is also a clinical supervisor and lecturer for the UCLA Genetic Counseling Master's Program. Brian Mack um, is a board-certified genetic counselor and licensed in California. He received his Master of Medical Science degree in Human Genetics and Genetic Counseling from Emory University in 2020. For the past two years, he has been the genetic counselor and study coordinator for the Undiagnosed Diseases Network, an NIH-funded study aiming to uncover the genetic basis of rare and undiagnosed disorders. Brian has been a supervisor and guest lecturer in the UCLA Genetic Counseling Master's Program. Thank you, Nagme, for that introduction. Um, I'll pull up my slides. So yes, Nagme and Brian and I are all genetic counselors and at the heart of what we do is genetic counseling. So I thought to set the stage for today's discussion, I can share with you what that process is like. Um, genetic counseling is defined as a, a process of helping people understand and adapt to the medical, psychological and familial implications of genetic contributions to disease. Uh, and as genetic counselors, we especially uh, like to emphasize the part that says, and adapt, uh, because we not only want to give um, patients the information, uh, the genetic information, but we also want them to uh, be able to apply that information to make decisions, manage their condition, um, and adapt uh, to situations. And when you see us uh, uh, for a visit, um, you are often going to see a, a multiple members of our genetics team. So this includes uh, a physician medical geneticist. Uh, you'll see one of our genetic counselors, uh, nurses, metabolic dietitians if needed, uh, social workers, and our genetic counseling assistants and administrators. Uh, and importantly, we serve both children and adults. Uh, and our most common uh, reason for referrals are birth defects, uh, metabolic disorders. Uh, these are the inborn errors of metabolism that are typically, um, that are often on the newborn screen uh, and then uh, get referred to us. Uh, developmental and intellectual disabilities, autism spectrum disorder, epilepsy, hearing loss, and really so much more. Um, it's often that I'll see a symptom or a condition that I've never seen before in my years here. 
so my job is very interesting and there's so much variety. And I will reiterate something that Caroline Quo um, mentioned earlier in that video that we played, that really in this field, you learn something new every single day. And during the visit, we'll obtain a medical and family history, provide you with a, um, a risk assessment. Um, we'll provide that genetic education. Uh, and during this, uh, the genetic education, we will try to deconstruct really complex genetics concepts and try to give them to you in digestible and simple terms. Uh, we'll give you medical and support resources that you can take home with you as well. Um, and then we provide that psychosocial assessment. And that's what I alluded to earlier. That's a very important part of the genetic counseling. Um, and think of this as we want to know what you're feeling um, because that way we can address feelings of um, shame or guilt or fears. Uh, and we can also correct some misconceptions. Um, for example, um, there are many genetic conditions where there could be multiple members of a family who are affected um, but how severe their symptoms are can vary. Um, the age that their symptoms begin can vary. Um, and many patients are unaware of the vari variability and they have that they had that thought that they were gonna have the same exact disease course as their other family members, which may not be the case. Uh, and we also want to um, empower our patients. So though we can't change the fact that they have the genetic condition, um, we can help change how they react to it. Um, how they're coming to terms with um, the uncertainty of risks um, and how they perceive the value of the medical interventions and treatments um, that may be recommended by their, the physicians. Um, and we also uh, uh, want to think about how can we increase our patients' perceived control in all of this. And then lastly, we will discuss if there are any risks to other family members or if we recommend genetic testing in other family members. Um, or if there's a chance of um, having an affected child and if there are any family planning options that could be available to the patient. So in the spirit of rare disease day, I wanted to share with you a clinical case where genetic testing uncovered a rare diagnosis uh, for a child who presented to us with seizures that were very difficult to control. She was on multiple anti-epileptic drugs. Um, she had global developmental delays. Um, and very poor muscle tone um, that we call hypotonia. Um, she had come to us already having had some genetic testing done. Um, it was a uh, genetic test for a set of genes that were associated with uh, seizure disorders, but that test did not come back with any diagnosis for any of those disorders tested. So then what we did was we, um, uh, Dr. Bianca Russell and I, we ordered a comprehensive genetic test called exome sequencing. And that looks at a, a, all of a person's genes. And that test did come back with a lead. Uh, our patient had two rare variants uh, or differences in a gene called pig S and she inherited one from each parent. But at that time, the pig S gene was not associated with any disorder. Um, but we were curious about it because genes in the same pathway as the pig S gene were associated with a group of disorders called congenital disorders of glycosylation. And glycosylation is just a process in our body that's very important. And if there's, a, if there's any um, disorder in this process, it can result uh, to neurologic issues similar to that of our patient. So that's why we were very suspicious that this could be the answer. And then we had found um, a paper in the medical literature describing seven children who had also had rare variants in the pig S gene uh, and had similar symptoms to our patient. So we reached out uh, to the author of that paper who is a geneticist and researcher uh, in Canada and inquired more about, about um, the patients that he described. And through the, that conversation, some insights we, gave, we, we, we got back was that uh, one of his patients had done very well, um, improved symptoms in starting uh, vitamin B6. And the pig S gene has an important role in vitamin B6 transport in the body. And so that's why that was a proposed treatment. So we initiated that in our patient and she had noticeable improvement in her development. Um, and she was really starting to meet her developmental milestones. Um, and at the same time, we'd also sent samples in to his research lab to do functional studies. And what that is, is to see if, um, if the variants 
in the PIGS gene were in fact impacting that gene's function. And indeed it did come back that there was a deficiency in, in the gene's function. And then uh, lastly, we used a database, which is sort of like a matchmaking tool where you can search for clinicians all over the world who might also have patients with rare variants in the PIGS gene. And through that matchmaking tool, we were able to find five additional patients um, who had also had similar uh, symptoms as our patient. So we published uh, the clinical details of now our six uh, cohort of six patients. Um, so now with this large body of evidence, I think you know we have enough evidence built that rare variants in the PIGS gene do result in this neurologic uh, uh, presentation. So in summary, uh, some of the outcomes of this uh, of finding a diagnosis for this patient is that we were able to initiate treatment like that vitamin B6 that I mentioned. Um, but not only that, um, our, our patient's parents were able to connect with other families um, who had uh, children with um, not PIGS disorder, but uh, disorders in the same pathway as the PIGS gene. And um, they had found out that some of the patients had done really well on a very uh, specific anti-epileptic drug. Um, their seizures were improved. And so after discussing this with uh, the patient's neurologist, they decided to switch to that anti-epileptic drug and her seizures were finally controlled um, with initiating that. So we were able to provide tailored treatment when, you know, because we had this diagnosis. And then now that we have a diagnosis, our patient uh, can be seen by experts in congenital disorders of glycosylation. So she has specialists now, part of her multidisciplinary care. Um, and parents have actually engaged scientists to work on cures for this ultra rare disorder. Um, so they're working on drug repurposing as well as other therapeutics. So it's really fascinating to see how far um, they've come um, and, and really working really hard um, to, to, have a, to get a cure for this condition. Um, and also parents were um, able to use in vitro fertilization um, and the genetic testing of embryos for future pregnancy planning. Um, and then I would say importantly, you know, um, publications um, and databases like RareX, I think really help to describe some of these rare diseases. Um, it really helps um, uh, get these get these genes to be on more genetic test offerings. Um, and I, I've noticed, and I was pleased to see that um, I took a look at some uh, gene panel tests for seizures. And now I've noticed this PIGS gene uh, is now included in some of these commercial tests. Um, so I think that's it's really interesting because we started off with a gene that wasn't associated with any known disorder. And, and now it's, it's um, offered on more test menus. So I think more, more and more people will be diagnosed with this rare condition. So I was happy that we were able to find answers for this uh, patient, um, but sometimes we have patients where all of our genetic testing um, comes back with, with no answers, um, where in cases where we really do believe that, that what's going on does have an underlying genetic role. Um, and, and so for those instances, we have to tap into research programs. So for example, like the Undiagnosed Disease Network, which have more tools and modalities that can help, um, help with these uh, undiagnosed cases. So I will, with that, I will pass it on to Brian Mack, who can share his experience as a genetic counselor with the Undiagnosed Disease Network. Great. Thank you, Marina. Um, all right. So my name is Brian Mack, and um, I work with the U. DN, um, the last two years. Um, right, here we go. I'm sorry. Let me go back. Okay. All right. So um, I just wanted to give a quick overview of the Undiagnosed Diseases Network. Um, the UDN is a NIH funded research study with the aim of discovering um, and diagnosing rare and, un uh, and undiscovered genetic disease. Uh, we are uh, 15 sites across the United States, and 12 of these are clinical sites, meaning that these sites are the ones um, actually seeing the patients and coordinating the care um, and testing that we do as part of the UDN. Um, so uh, currently, the UDN has received about uh, 5,300 applications. We've accepted about 2,100 and evaluated um, 1,700 patients. Um, and out of those 1,700 uh, participants, we have diagnosed 505 of them. 
So um, our team here at UCLA um, are experts in medical and human genetics. So within the UDN, we have, of course, genetic counseling, we have patient navigators, um, physicians, human geneticists, um, physicians of all specialties um, across immunology, neurology, genetics, all with expertise um, in genetics to help work up our participants um, and help direct exactly what sort of research and what sort of follow-up we would want to do to help our patients find a diagnosis. Uh, diagnosis. Uh, we do have a focus on rare and ultra rare disease. Um, the uh, Orphan Drug Act of 1983 defines rare disease as affecting less than 200,000 people um, in the United States. Um, it's estimated that about 72% of rare diseases are monogenic, meaning they are caused by um, a single genetic change or a change in one single gene. Um, and that number is potentially even higher for ultra rare diseases. Uh, individually, uh, these rare diseases um, don't affect that many people, but altogether um, are estimated to affect about 200 to 400 million people worldwide. Um, and the UDN really works to characterize not only new gene disease relationships, um, but to also expand the known uh, spectrum of genetic conditions that have already been discovered. Right. Um, so I'm going to take you through a case, um, a UDN case, uh, to really highlight exactly what the workflow is for the UDN, um, as well as highlight what tools we have as part of the UDN that really allow us to do what we do um, in the rare disease space. So after a patient is consented and enrolled into the UDN, um, we do see them for a clinical evaluation here at UCLA. So uh, with this uh, Case example, uh, we have a two-year-old boy who was referred with congenital hypotonia, developmental delay and regression uh, of that development, dysmorphic features and obesity. Um, and during the clinical evaluation, we did an intake, we reviewed his entire medical history um, and he was seen by our UDN doctors here at UCLA. Uh, now, one of the biggest tools, uh, if not the biggest tool we have here at the UDN uh, is whole genome sequencing. Um, and this sort of testing is a little different from uh, what most people think of in genetic testing. Um, a lot of genetic testing now is done in panels or exomes where we're looking at very specific parts of the gene. With whole genome sequencing, we are looking at all genes and we're looking at every part of that gene as well. Uh, even genes that at this point do not have any association with a human condition or a human disorder. Um, now, with our clinical workup, again, he saw multiple specialists. Um, it is possible we may grab um, additional cl clinical imaging or order different types of clinical testing beyond um, um, the genetic testing. Um, and beyond just uh, the genetic testing, we may also use multi, uh, multi, multi disciplinary tools uh, such as model organism experience, uh, experiments or metabolomics testing um, or RNA sequencing as well. Um, so through our whole genome sequencing, we did identify that our patient had a de novo change in a gene called PRKAR1B. Now, de novo just means that it was not inherited. We did not see this change in uh, either of his parents. Um, so we know that this change happened in our participant for the very first time. Um, and at the time, P, uh, PRKAR1B was not associated with any human disorder. Uh, similarly to Marina's case, we uh, brought this gene and this finding to an online matchmaking database called uh, Gene Matcher. Um, and in doing so, we are able to see if there are other clinicians around the world who have participants uh, who also have interesting or unique findings in certain genes. Uh, and through this matchmaking process, we were actually able to connect with six other individuals that were identified that had strikingly similar features to our participant, um, as well as changes in the exact same gene. And through collaboration agreements, we were able to get a case series published, um, and we were able for the first time to establish a new gene disease relationship with the PRKAR1B gene. Um, this paper was published, um, and after this was published, our, a patient was uh, able to receive an official diagnosis, and the genetic testing report was able to be addended to, uh, to reflect that, um, as well as its new classification as a disease gene. 
Uh, and like Marina mentioned earlier, that uh, means that when other patients get any sort of genetic testing and have similar features like our patient does, um, then it, then they're able to then look at the medical literature, see that you know changes in this gene are associated with these features, and and received a diagnosis for themselves uh, as well. All right. Um, I have another case as well that highlights some of the other tools that we have here um, at the UDN. So uh, this patient at the time of her enrollment in the UDN was an 11 year old female with autism, dysmorphic features, developmental delay, some birth defects uh, and hypotonia. Prior to her enrollment, um, she had previous genetic testing that identified two variants of uncertain significance in a gene called CAD, C-A-D. Uh, now, the CAD gene is associated with the congenital disorder of glycosylation, specifically CDG1Z. Um, but these uh, findings in the CAD gene were considered uncertain. Uh, there wasn't really great evidence that these changes could result um, in CDG1Z, um, but there also wasn't ev enough evidence to say that we know that these changes are benign. Um, interestingly enough, there were some overlapping features uh, from what CDG1Z is known to have been reported um, with this patient, and that included um, psychomotor delay, uh, poor speech, the hypotonia, um, and some findings in her blood work. Uh, both of the variants were seen in population databases, so they weren't necessarily rare. Um, and the locations of these variants within the gene were not very well conserved. So variants have been known to be found in, those part, uh, in that part of the gene. Uh, so once they were enrolled in the UDN, we did want to just really do all we could do to either establish the diagnosis of CDG1Z um, or to rule it out. And so uh, we sent off blood work to our uh, one of our uh, metabolomics cores at the Mayo Clinic uh, that works really, uh, that is part of the UDN. Um, and we tested two different uh, glycosylation products. Um, and if this test had uh, were to come back positive, then we know that um, our patient does have a congenital disorder of glycosylation. Um, the testing did come back negative, so we were able to rule out uh, CAD as the diagnosis. Um, and so this is just one example of how we can use tools beyond genetic testing um, within the UDN to um, better understand some of the findings that we see um, in our patient's data. Um, now, after this, uh, we were able to, now after we were able to rule it out, uh, we did a whole Whole exome reanalysis. So we were able to grab uh, to collect the whole uh, exome data from our patient that was done previously and reanalyze it ourselves. We were also able to use RNA sequencing to see exactly if a gene or gene product was defective. Now, RNA sequencing is different from genetic testing. Um, it's a type of test that really augments genetic testing and is able to help us look at genetic data um, using uh, a different technology. Um, unfortunately, at the time, um, both the reanalysis of the exome data and the RNA sequencing did not identify um, really any good candidate genes or other variants um, in the patient's data. Um, so at this time, the patient does remain undiagnosed. Um, but the UDN has been able to then use other data sharing methods to see um, if there are any other interesting findings. Um, but at this Part, we are still currently working this patient up. Uh, now, if you, uh, after this presentation, think that you may be a good candidate for the UDN um, or the CCRD, um, the application is all online here at this website. Um, the UDN is run um, a, uh, by the Coordinating Center at Harvard Medical School. If you Google um, Undiagnosed Diseases Network application, um, the website will come up uh, pretty easily. Um, within the application, uh, in addition to some demographic information, we do require a letter of recommendation be submitted for all of our uh, all interested applicants. And this letter of recommendation does need to come from either a physician or a healthcare provider. 
Um, a summary, uh, and the letter should include a summary of the applicant's medical issues um, and a timeline of when these issues were noticed. Um, for pediatric patients, we really like to see birth history and prenatal information, um, any previous diagnoses a patient may have had, what evaluations and what treatments have they had, what testing, especially genetic testing, is always really helpful, um, as well as a family history. Right. Um, we do see both pediatric and adult patients um, within the UDN, um, and it, uh, we do focus in on uh, accepting patients that have a high likelihood of a single gene disorder. Uh, and so our indications, by and large, are very similar to those seen um, in a typical genetics clinic as well. Um, some example of these conditions can include neurogenetic disorders, including disorders that have neurodevelopmental um, issues, intellectual disability, neuromuscular issues, or epilepsies. Um, we can also see immune deficiencies, as well as patients with congenital anomalies um, um, and birth defects. Uh, Perhaps most importantly, it, uh, it is important that all previous genetic testing has been uninformative. Um, and that can include chromosomal microarrays, genetic panel testing, whole exome sequencing, and mitochondrial testing, uh, amongst other types of genetic testing. Um, and really to set yourself up for success, we really like to see um, specialist letters and consult consultation notes. Um, not all of our patients have seen a geneticist, but it's always helpful for our patients to have seen a physician, um, even in a different specialty with expertise in genetics. Um, and that really just makes sure that our patients are receiving the full gamut of available clinical genetic testing prior to their application to the UDN. Um, and then lastly, you know, if there's any clinical imaging or other lab test reports that are available, um, we also like to see those as well. Um, overall, our patients within the UDN are really fantastic and very motivated to seek answers. Um, and it's an absolute privilege to work with these patients. Um, they're motivated, um, they're always willing to kind of jump in with whatever research we throw at them, any suggestions we have, they readily take. Um, and I have really learned so much from working um, with these families. Um, I've learned to be a better genetic counselor, researcher, um, and person because of this experience um, with the families in the UDN. Thank you, Marina and Brian. Um, for sharing your insights. Um, before we conclude um, our discussion today, I, I'd like to take the opportunity and um, pose a few questions that we commonly receive them um, in, in a clinic, genetics clinic, and also for um, the UD and the Undiagnosis Network. Um, Marina, let's start with you. Um, if someone is concerned about the possibility of a genetic condition, where do they start? That's a great question. Uh, so I would say start um, with an evaluation by a medical specialist. So if the symptom you're concerned about is, uh, let's say, your heart, go see go see a cardiologist. Um, and then that specialist will then obtain objective data, and they can determine if there is a suspicion for a genetic disorder that explains what's going on. So um, and then if so, that that specialist can order the diagnostic genetic test for you, um, or uh, refer to uh, genetics providers um, to coordinate testing uh, and counseling. Thank you, Marina. A follow-up question, uh, Marina, and we get this question a lot, actually. Um, how will testing for genetic conditions impact a patient's life insurance, uh, disability insurance, and other insurances? Okay. Um, well, there is a law, it's called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, um, or also known as GINA. Uh, it's a law that prevents discrimination on the basis of genetic information uh, when it comes to any aspect of employment and health insurance. There are a few exceptions, though. Um, but however, GINA does not apply to other insurances like life insurance, disability, long-term care coverage. Uh, so be sure to do your due diligence and advocate for yourself. Um, and there are a lot of resources online about Gina with more details. Thank you, Marina. Um, Brian, um, a question for you. You kind of alluded to that, you know, at the end of your talk. Um, and this is regarding UDN. Um, how would someone know they're a good candidate for UDN? 
Yeah, um, again, so really the two biggest factors will be uninformative genetic testing um, and consultation, prior consultation with a physician with expertise in genetics. Um, if you are interested in applying to the UDN or the CCRD and don't have any prior genetic testing, um, please speak with your doctor first to see if you may be a good candidate. Um, and again, it's always helpful to consult with the physician with expertise in genetics. Um, they don't necessarily have to be a geneticist, but again, having that expertise is always helpful. Thank you. And another follow-up question, Brian. Uh, what will happen? And this question from comes, you know, from a parent. What will happen after my child is diagnosed in the UDN? Is there a follow-up process? Yeah, so after a diagnosis is found, we do send a letter with all of the details of the findings, as well as all of the UDN clinical documentation, as well as clinical reports that we generate as part of the UDN, um, both to you and your referring provider. Um, this information can be then shared with any other doctors you or, uh, your child may see, um, but the UDN does not coordinate any care after a diagnosis is found. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Brian. Um, Marina, a final question for you. Um, can you touch on whether all chronic conditions need a genetic workup? Yes, this has come up um, a lot, actually, um, because not all chronic conditions are suitable for a genetic workup because the as of yet unidentified uh, unidentified uh, genetic contributions of that condition. So for example, autoimmune disorders, autoinflammatory disorders, um, hypermobility spectrum, we have not identified an underlying genetic uh, cause yet. And so um, it becomes very frustrating because then we in the genetics field can't yet give answers or assist. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Marina. Um, Brian, a last and final question for you. Um, if someone's child had an exome sequencing and the test did not identify any genetic change that could explain the, the, the symptoms, would it need it to be repeated in the future? Um, so most of the time, exome sequencing tests can be reanalyzed. Um, and what that means is the lab can actually go back to the data that's already been generated um, when ordering the exome the first time um, and can reanalyze and reinterpret that data with new information from the published literature. So you don't necessarily need to repeat the test. Um, you know, more so than just really just ordering the reanalysis. Um, you would need to discuss this with your geneticist or who had uh, whoever had ordered um, that exome the first time around. Um, reanalysis of an uninformed exome is usually recommended after two years um, after the test was initially ordered. Um, so if your exome was ordered a while back, it is recommended that the referring provider um, order the reanalysis prior to, you know, say applying to the UDN or the CCRD. Okay. Um, thank you both for sharing your expertise um, with us today and those of you listening. Um, please know there are teams here at UCLA um, to support you and whatever journey you are on um, uh, related to your genetics and health condition. Uh, now I'd like to uh, turn it back to Stan. Thank you. Thank you, Agne. Thank you, Brian and Marina. So I think you can see from all of this, you know, the passion in people's voices and their commitment to, to help with patients and also to move the ball forward in terms of uh, diagnostic uh, accuracy for, for rare diseases. So, you know, just to reiterate the California Center for Rare Diseases, we are working to improve diagnostics and improve uh, treatments, improve access to clinical trials and the like. And this is a long-term commitment. And as Dr. Geshwind indicated, uh, please watch this space in terms of new and exciting uh, comments and also new and exciting areas of development around genomic medicine uh, on campus. You can definitely reach us at the California Center for Rare Diseases. You can find us online. If you put in California Center for Rare Diseases in UCLA, you can find us uh, on our web pages. The email is ccrd at mednet.ucla.edu. And I'd like to thank all the panelists and speakers uh, from today for joining us. Thank you very much. And thank you all for signing in and joining us for the day.